So uh, I'm Paul Perone. I've, I've been coming to this conference for a while, uh, doing a lot of different types of robot presentations over the years and um, some automation. And uh, a lot of the bots that I uh, brought here were bigger, um, like the DARPA Grand Challenge and the Urban Challenge robots. And then there was Neil Young's car. And these aren't things that you can you know, readily just kind of procure off the shelf. Um, so uh, we started to think about how to, you know, we've got this Max robotics platform built on Java. How can we make, and we're going to open source it, how can we make this more accessible to folks? Um, because, you know, it's, it's, there's only one link volt car of Niels and, and uh, li limited supply of other larger bots. So, so we focused on some smaller bots and, um, and, and uh, and codifying that in a book as well. Let's see. So there's only one slide apparently. How does this work? This is what multi screen. Huh. Let me see. What's that? No, I've got some. I've got this multi-window thing that I'm going to get out of right now, so that I can avoid this issue. Uh, because this is a new Mac, and things don't seem to mirror well, or not mirror well. Um, Let's see if this works. Oops. Oops. So, yeah, this is what I need. Okay. This is a how-to on creating robots. Um, we're focused here on just, you know, how to rapidly program robots using Java and these higher-level libraries. Um, the key components of any robot is, you know, sensing, planning, and actuation. So those are... Um, you know, that's robot software in a nutshell. You sense from your environment, you formulate some plan of attack um, or some decisions to make, and then you actuate something. So um, this is sort of a repulsively cluttered diagram showing the, uh, the components at play. And, um, and what we have here is is the, um, you know, we, we of course run on the Java virtual machine. We've got, you know, different types of operating environments supported by Java. Uh, we run on different profiles of Java, ME, SC, some real-time profiles. And then we built this sort of set of building blocks that, that make it easier to build um, uh, general purpose and some specific types of uh, robots and automation applications. Um, using um, just a number of, uh, of, of generic abstractions that are highly configurable. So we've got a sensor object that's highly configurable um, that we can specify how to packetize data coming in over uh, a serial port or an Ethernet port without having the right code. We just specify in config files and then the data comes in, we get these objects and, and all the low level sort of messiness of dealing with with that is kind of handled underneath the hood. That's like an example of a, of a service. Um, and there's a, there's a wide variety of services and abstractions because there's a big gap between writing robotics applications and actually getting something to run on hardware, especially if there's a wide range of hardware. Um, we've got, there's all kinds of mobility platforms. You've got different types of processors, um, you know, just issues running in, in some micro environments. So, um, felt the need, actually this was developed about a little over 12 years, almost 12 years ago, started this endeavor um, and built up this, uh, this, this uh, Max platform with some 
concrete drivers for specific sensors and some frameworks um, for, for more vertical oriented applications. And it runs in a lightweight container as an option or you can you know, access the objects using standard API calls like, like plain old Java objects. So that's Max in a nutshell. I gave a talk yesterday talking a little bit more about the architecture of it in the embedded track. But this is the smaller robot family that, um, that we're um, targeting in a book uh, uh, for, through Manning called Programming um, Robots. And there's five different bots um, ranging from something imminently affordable that the junior bot over there would be something that's like under $200, some total between the mobility platform, which is $50, and the processor, and some sensors. And then we've got Linksy and, and, the, and an iRobot, iCreate robot that are in the probably uh, four to uh, uh, $500 range when all is said and done. Then we have Rumbles, who's, who's here today. Um, it's about a $1,600 mobility platform, so it's more research grade. Um, and then once you add on sensors, I mean, you, you know, you can add on very expensive sensors and, and the price can go up from there. But typically, you're in it for about $2,500, $2,000 for that. So that's like a computer, but maybe it's your general purpose robot uh, at that point. And then we have Brutus here, which can carry a mean payload. It's a very commercial, industrial grade robot. It's about $5,000. And, um, and uh, so the whole idea is to show that the same application code using these abstractions can be written once and run on these different platforms just using different, con different underlying configurations. You may even be using the same sensor, so you might not have to change the configurations, but you'll have to tweak parameters like you know, the, the baseline between two sensors is going to be different on, on one robot versus another. So this is the, the target. We call them the ARD bots because we're bad at naming things. Um, but they're kind of like ground, R, I think, means ground, and RD means, um, uh, what does that mean, like uh, retrieve and, oh, something. But anyway, that's, that's the name of these bots. And um, so this is Rumble's hardware. Um, uh, we've got uh, the mobility platform from this company called uh, Gears uh, Research Group, um, makes this thing called SMP Mobility Platform. MP is probably redundant with my mobility platform there, but it's the Surface Mobility Platform. It's designed for outdoor operation. Um, and so we found, of course, that when we run it on carpeting, like in a conference, uh, he doesn't, oddly enough, do so well. So we gave him um, uh, uh, like the equivalent of, of, of wire chains to, to make him, we put some duct tape on his wheels to make him run more smoothly in here. Uh, an environment like this, but it's designed for outdoor um, bots. You, basically, the thing articulates such that it can, you know, one end can roll over a rock, and uh, while the other, while the other side stays flat, and uh, and it can get up to, oh, I don't know, five or six miles an hour, something like that, maybe a little faster. With um, and you can change out motors. There are deer, DC geared motors driving the wheels. On board, there is of course a battery. Uh, we've got um, the Fidgets, what's called the company Fidgets, makes this um, single board computer. It's an ARM-based computer with an I.O. kit um, and some of their motor controllers that plug right in to drive these motors. Um, it's Wi-Fi connected, and we'll see how Wi-Fi does here today with the demo. That's always the, oh, you know, w w we wanted to have it Wi-Fi based because uh, I wanted to show you what it's doing um, without writing some sophisticated GUI, but um, so we'll see how that goes. But but we have it Wi-Fi connected and streaming uh, what it's doing back to us to a terminal. And, um, and the front sensors are, there's some cliff sensors, because we, we heard we're going to be bringing this out, out on the show floor later this week where um, there might be a stage. So we quickly added some cliff sensors so that he doesn't drop off the stage. Those are IR sensors, infrared sensors just send out a beam and tell you the range to where something is, and so if that exceeds a certain distance, we know um, we should respond. And then there's some front, uh, an ultrasonic sensor and an IR sensor for redundancy to avoid impacts, and then some sensors on the port and starboard sides for, for detecting kind of the sides of, of the vehicle, or sides of the environment. And then we added sort of towards the whole, not, well, one of the last later minute things that we added was this um, 
uh, Fit PC, this x86 processor connected to this Xteon Pro Live camera, which is essentially the Kinect sensor technology. It's, it's got this chip in it from PrimeSense. There's a gentleman here um, actually doing a talk, or maybe here did his talk on hacking the Kinect sensor um, that talks a lot about, about this, um, how to use Java to talk to sent, uh, this kind of sensor. But we're talking to this Xteon Pro Live sensor because it's something that's more distributable than the Kinect sensor, which Microsoft kind of, unless you use their, their development kit, they, they won't let you distribute it. And if you use their development kit, you're bound to Windows. And we happen to be running on Windows right now, but that's not where we want to always be. So this is just a picture of, if you can't see, the robot from back there. This is the, the, what the robot looks like now. Um, you can see the Kinect sensor and some of the, some of the IR sensors. Um, and, uh, and his uh, glory. So this is the software stack. We've got a, um, we've got a, uh, on the Fit PC, there's the, you know, we're running XP, we're running Java SE, we're running Max Common, which is sort of where 99% of our lowest common denominator building block code is for general purpose robotics. And then we've got Max Standard, which uh, leverages some SE oriented libraries as we need them, like for file IO or something. And then, um, and then we have our application here that we built for, for the book and, for, and that we're demonstrating here, um, uh, which is this we call Open an Eye Robot Eye, where we've got a, a, a driver interface that uh, lets us talk to these third party drivers um, and, and bring this data into the, um, into the application from, from the sensor, the, the uh, Kinect sensor, which is going to give you depth and camera information. We're using it for its depth information. On board on the Fidgets processor, kind of a similar stack from here, except it's Linux. Um, there's the Fidgets drivers um, that talk to some of the low-level Fidgets devices, and we've got a Max interface for that that is basically wrappers and plugs in that plugs it into the framework that lets it expose itself as expose their sensors as sensors that, that can be configured and their actuation mechanisms as actuation mechanisms that can be driven. And then we have what's called Max UGV Core, which is a smaller subset of what we use for the DARPA Grand Challenges. We, we, after the DARPA, we had this Max UGV framework that we applied to both the DARPA Grand Challenge and the Urban Challenge. And then we generis, started to genericize it a little bit so that the same, some of the same stuff for these outdoor GPS-based bots could be used for any type of unmanned ground vehicle application, so indoor, for example, applications. And so there's some common libraries there. Executing a Max app is, is, is fairly straightforward. We just say it's, it's highly configuration-based. We say, you know, Java, and we point to some uh, location of a configuration file, and we say Max, and that's sort of like the main class that, that looks for um, uh, an, an app, uh, an application.xml object. We're actually not bound to XML, but um, there's different configuration mediums, but the but the, you know, this is typically what we use. It will look for an application XML file, and then that tells the application how to load everything else from there. And I'll just, I'll show you that. You can also um, just, just, you can bypass specifying the config and, and assume some default property structure, or if you've created an executable jar, you can just make a call like that. Um, so that's just an example for, for how to create these ma these uh, uh, objects. So this is kind of what a max config file um, looks like. We've got, um, you know, there's always some sort of, co there's a context and you can have a number of contexts or directories and then you have your object name. Um, you define, you know, the class. This is like a generic factory, a class that's going to be created. Um, and then configuration parameters that are going to be passed that are specific to that object that's being constructed. So. Um, as an example, a quick example for configuring an app, we've got an app.application file which says, okay, we're, um, and these are all generic max classes that, that, um, that, that you know, don't need to be rewritten, but um, we reference um, a robot object which defines some of the core, core components, in this case, um, this motor exercise uh, application object, a planning object, and a sensor, a inputs, command input sensor just from the command line. 
And uh, they, so the command input sensor, um, uh, um, you know, when it gets data, is, is told to route information back over to the motor exercise object. The motor exercise object, and when we'll show some code examples, of course, to, to, to illustrate this, but um, is basically this application-specific thing that we wrote for the, for the book, which says, okay, here's a list of motors. Um, and each motor has configuration as something like this. There's some generic motor configuration which references um, how it's going to be pulse width modulated. In this case, uh, we're, we're, we're using the fidget, a fidget motor controller uh, uh, approach to, to drive these motors, telling it, um, you know, we're using this fidget controller um, and this output number. So these are fidget specific XML files. And then we have to tell it things like, um, uh, you know, a, a fidget serial number. This is all part of the fidgets um, uh, infrastructure. Um, and then we refer to a common target, which just tells us the IP address um, uh, where the um, where the fidget is 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 listening. In this, in the case when it's running on board the rot, uh, robot, as it will be today, that's uh, just you know one twenty seven zero zero one. So controlling motors. So you saw how we had this um, the the motor DC motor exercise object saying, okay, I have a list of motors. In this case, there's this object map. We create an object map. We tell it to configure uh, this this map, and what that does is it's going to load automatically all those motor objects into memory and call call all these objects and create this object lattice, such that um, when we get a command in this in this case, uh, this is a text based uh, input application, we get a command to say run, um, and we parse some data from the command, like the, like the motor ID to look up, and the run rate, we just tell it motor.run at that rate, and then the motor will run at that rate. So that's controlling individual motors, which can be tedious. So, and so we'll get into the Roam Free app here that, that we'll be talking about and demonstrating here today. Um, you know, controlling individual motors, again, uh, is not necessarily what you want to do. You want to control the platform, the mobility platform. You want the bot to move forward. You want them to, to rotate. You want them to stop. So that's where something like this comes in play, where you say, okay, I'm going to load my, a motor mobility platform object. In this case, it's a skid steer platform. I don't know if you're familiar with skid steer, but left side, right side can be independently you know, controlled so the left side can be rolling backwards as the right side can be rolling forwards and you're sort of turning. It's just skid steer based operation versus like Ackerman steering which is like in a car where you're steering a steering wheel and the two front wheels are moving. So those are two different uh, mobility models. And this happens to be skid steer platform. Um, so the calls here are now higher level because we're saying mobility platform move at this rate. And so that handles dispatching um, the, the uh, individual commands to the, to the motors for you or rotate and that handles, you know, uh, uh, depending on the polarity of, of the rate, which direction it's going to rotate uh, the platform and, um, and the speed. And then of course you can move the port side and the starboard side at different rates if you want to kind of affect turns. And then stop is usually an important command. So this is an example of <coughs> a mobility um, configuration file. Um, so we had here this, mo uh, this mobilization uh, application which is saying, okay, I've got my mobility platform reference. I'm going to load this skid steer platform generic object. This is in Max UGV core and, and there's a skid steer map and it's saying, okay, on the port side I'm linked up with these two motors and on the starboard side I'm linked up with those two motors. And you saw an example of how we configured uh, motors before. Um, so, and that's all there is to it. So it's like, a, it's, it's this abstraction, layer of abstraction that lets you get to uh, controlling motors and controlling a platform a lot faster because you throw down some uh, config files, um, templates, and there's pre-existing templates that we typically use. We copy them and, and uh, just use those and, and, and modify them. So that's, in a nutshell, actuation, uh, motoring and mobility. So there's the sensation part. And uh, for this, we've got um, what we call these different object sensation perspectives. 
So with this robot, we've got um, uh, four views. We've got what we call the front view, which is basically um, going to be here, as you can see, it's the um, uh, uh, it's, it's referring to these two sensor files, which happens to contain the configuration for the front IR sensor and the front ultrasonic sensor. Then we've got cliff view, which refers to the two cliff sensors, um, port view, which refers to the uh, port side IR sensor, and starboard view, which refers to the starboard side. So there's, there's, there's different views. Um, so for, for an actual... so. So this showed you how, um, for example, the front view refers to a particular sensor file. So here's an example of a sensor file. Um, we've, uh, we're specifying that we've got this, um, at this generic max class analog input generic, and its interface is going to be the, f um, uh, f so, so that we can talk to things independent of whether it's a fidgets object. If we change over to some other object, we just specify a different interface. But in this case, the interface is this fidget analog interput, which is um, telling us to load this fidget driver and specifying some parameters about it in terms of like what input number on the fidget interface kit are we talking to, um, and how to, in this case, scale the raw data that comes from this. It's basically an analog input from this fidgets device. It's telling us, you know, what's the equation for mapping that to a meaningful value. So this, m these magic numbers here map it, and this is just built into the sharp IR sensor um, uh, nature. When it says it's this voltage um, to get the millimeters range, you have to apply this, you know, this equation in here, and then we apply some limits on the minimum input value and maximum output value for, um, for checking those sensors. So, so here's an example in code now of, of again, using uh, the sensor. So we've uh, we've got our own robot relative obstacle detection class that we've created that extends this, this uh, generic class. And um, we say, okay, we've got an object map of inputs. We ask it to load them. Um, uh, during um, the start of sensation, we, we clear our sensed objects. And then as we're, uh, when, when, when this via, via the callback chain is invoked to sense objects, it loops through its analog inputs. Um, reads the value, the value read here will have already been the transformed value, um, the millimeters range value from the IR sensor, and then we're passing it on to this, um, to this obstacles, objects, uh, object to say, okay, here, here's, here's this reading, and this reading will, I'll show you um, right here, uh, this class will say, okay, um, if the distance is less than um, you know, the collision, uh, the, the current worst case collision distance, make the collision distance this shorter distance. If the distance is greater than some max obstacle distance, make the max obstacle distance that distance. So this is a very simple class just looking for the min and max distances. In this case, we only had two sensors, so um, pretty easy to do. So that sensation in a nutshell. Um, so now moving on to planning, which is where where the fun stuff happens. So, um, but the, the interesting just sidebar on that is a lot. Of, you know, if you were creating all this sensor code and and actuation code from scratch, it takes takes a long time. It's boring. It's fraught with with error. And you know, you're doing it over and over again for a hundred. You know, all these different applications and all these in this case five or so different bots. If you were to <coughs> create all five bots, or or you want to move on to the next project, you want to scale up from the small bot to the large bot. Um, as your spouse allows you to um, afford the, the Brutus 5000 uh, gold standard robot. Um, so, um, so we get to that very quick, writing very little code. Unfortunately, I didn't include any like, statistics as to how much code there is. I was thinking about doing that, but I just never did it. But it's, it's a lot less code that you would have to write. Um, and... Um, so the, what's the Roam-free application? This is just a simple, um, we thought about, you know, what should we show for the book and what, what can we show here in a meaningful time frame? And so we took something simple that, that could be built upon. And it's just a, ro it's a roamer. So, so this robot <coughs> is going um, to roam around. 
um, sense the environment, det detect collisions, distances, angles to uh, those collisions, execute specific maneuvers based on um, these sensed distances and angles. Um, and with the key idea that a maneuver is just a sequence of maneuver actions. So impact avoidance, as we'll see, when we detect that, impact avoidance leads to stop, that's one action, spin, that's another action. Um, am I forgetting something? Am, oh no, stop, back up, spin, and then move on. So, so those are the three actions that form that, that form that maneuver. And then there's of course, we have to prioritize which maneuvers are executed first. Impact avoidance has it's got a higher priority than just roaming. Yes? A question. You were saying it goes like five or six miles. Did you do that speed based on the reaction time it needs to the sensor? I'm sorry, five or six miles. You said it goes five or six miles per hour? Oh, yeah. Uh, so is it like did you decide to have it go that speed because it needs a certain amount of time to react to sensor? Um, well, we started out just gunning it like at its max speed. And, um, and which is, uh, and, um, you know, we found that, you know, it wasn't reacting in time. So, um, but then we tightened some control loops and then we, you know, it's just a, it's just something that you tinker with and then, and then you can control what the max speed is. And, but, but we, in the roaming mode, as we'll see, it slows down. Like if it starts to see stuff in its periphery, it'll slow down a little bit. But if it feels like it's home free, he's like, okay, I'm going my max speed. So in an environment like this, it's going to be kind of hard because he's, I'm going to send them maybe that way and see what happens. But maybe we can, maybe we'll just take him out there and see if he uh, avoids the escalator. I mean, I'm game for it. If he, in a, it, well, yeah, if the, if the network works, we'll, we'll get that going. But the, um, so this is the, uh, let's see, where do I want to be at 40? Yeah. So this is the roam-free uh, configuration. We've got our base application object, which is saying, okay, now we have a movement planner. And this is, this is the key planner object. And then we've got some synchronous thread that's triggering this thing every uh, 25 you know, milliseconds. Um, and, uh, and our robot uh, file has a couple other things here. I've got some, I can actually command it via the command line to stop. Um, the minimal uh, attention to safety given to this, given the size of, of, of the robot, but um, and for the and for demonstration purposes. But you know, I do have that. T typically, I would have like some sort of remote e stop mechanism. For the big cars, you need the remote e stop mechanism um, and and other safety. And you need heartbeats and watchdogs and all that kind of stuff. This thing's kind of got free will. Um, and then there's an interface to the to the connect sensor. So here's what we want to accomplish algorithmically. If, if we bump or, we, or if we are impactful in the front, we want to back up a bit, spin around, move along. Um, else, if all's good in that front, um, if we're collidable, we think, on the fronts or sides based on the starboard and port sensors, we might trigger uh, a slightly more aggressive rotation where it'll stop and rotate to, uh, you know, as a, a proportional to the collision angle. Um, else, if all's well, and there's no imminent impact or imminent collision, we're going to roam around, and we're going to trigger slight adjust adjustments as we see things along the way. We're going to adjust our speed based on these collision distances. We're going to look for openings and hone in for those openings. And as we see things on our left and right, we're going to, you know, make corrections. So, um, and here's how movement planning works. This is a max framework thingy, but basically if we're in run or enable mode, um, we induce any sensation updates, so we, um, they, they may be coming in asynchronously, but we, but we lock them in for this planning cycle. We ask the maneuvers based on this to detect if they are active. Um, then we resolve and prioritize which maneuvers to actually execute, which ones have higher priority. Um, uh, and then we ask the remaining active uh, we, act, we ask any of the remaining active maneuvers after that that are not told to ignore this cycle to execute. Um, else, you know, we ensure the mobility platform is stopped if we're not in run enable mode. So here's the movement planner configuration. Um, we've got a reference to 
um, our mobility platform, which we already talked about, skid steer, our object detection, which we talked about, which is our sensor package. And now we've got a collection of maneuvers, and, this, and the mode is ordered priority consideration, where this one supersedes this one, supersedes this one, this one, this one. And the, and the five modes, do I describe them? Next slide, no. The five modes are, um, well, let me, I'll just, I do describe them somewhere. So I'll describe impact avoidance first, or via example. So um, this is, a, um, this is a, some sample code, uh, custom code that one would write uh, referencing it, where we say, okay, the minimum collision distance is 250 millimeters for, for something to be considered an impact. And the actions that we'll execute are stop, robot, roll back, spin. So here's a base class for uh, avoidance maneuver, a custom class that we created for this application uh, to, to let us um, reference our different views um, and read in our min and max collision distances. It's just a base class for, for doing that. And so here's a subclass <coughs> of avoidance maneuver using that uh, avoid, uh, avoidance maneuver um, uh, behavior. It's self-exiting, meaning this maneuver will not allow itself to be considered inactive until it completes all of its tasks, because you don't want it to sort of, as it backs up, realize, oh, okay, now I'm not, I don't have an impact, and then it'll just do the hokey pokey for a while as it, so this, it's gonna complete all three actions in this case. So, so we get our, our list of front obstacles, we say, hey, where's the collision distance for the front? Um, if the front distance is less than what we had it configured to be, 250 millimeters, uh, we're going to say we've got a collision vector straight ahead, and that's our collision distance, return true. So that tells the framework that that, that, that maneuver is active. So that maneuver will be uh, told to um, handle. And so here's the three actions. They're very simple. So the stop robot action, this is the code for it. It extends this movement action when it's told to execute, it says stop. Very simple. Um, rollback action's a little bit more complicated, but not much. We've, uh, we've only did something, we don't have uh, heading sensors and things like that on this simple robot example. So what we're just doing with this uh, example in the, in, in the book and, and here is just we're gonna roll back for 10 seconds at a certain speed. Um, and so in this case, uh, that's just showing that this is configured. Um, bi-directional wheel platform is actually a, a, a super class of skid steer. It just makes it more suitable for other, uh, um, other, other types of platforms so that we don't make it skid steer specific. But the basic idea, idea here is when it's told to execute, it's, it's going to move um, at this rollback speed. And it's going to continue to move at that rollback speed until until it times out, because this is a timed action maneuver. That action timeout seconds is configured, and when it times out, this method is called, and the, and the action stops. So spin is um, kind of similar to the last in that um, we're going to rotate at a certain configured speed for three seconds, and when we're done, we stop. So that's the code. It's, it's, Try to keep it simple. So these are some of the other maneuvers um, that uh, we have. Uh, there's cliff avoidance, which is the one I mentioned. We're um, if uh, we have it configured such that if something's more than five, 550 meters away from those cliff sensors, it triggers that and it, and it goes into stop, roll back, and spin. Um, uh, I know the question on everyone's mind is: Does this bot have any sensors on the back? The answer is no. Uh, so, so, but you know, for this, for these examples, um, again, to keep it simple, um, you know, we we try to limit that. But but that's an example where you know you you know you add on something. You want to add typically something like backup sensors for a bot like this so that it can know not to back into things. And you'll see um, it wreaks some havoc on my son's toys um, and makes him cry. So, um, <laughs> so that's good to avoid. So, and then we've got a roaming maneuver where we've got an Ethernet connection to um, the, uh, this ro robot eye sent, uh, server that we call on the FIP PC. It gets a collection of features, which just tell us, are, are we, do we have openings, dents, or bumps 
and it's looking for openings, and if it has openings, it, it goes towards those. Um, it modulates its speed and its, and its you know, port and starboard uh, adjustments to get into those openings. Um, and if it doesn't have any openings, um, presumably one of the other maneuvers have kicked in because it's got a, a, an avoidance problem. And then, because this was a late addition, we actually started out with IR roaming, just using the IR sensors. And there's, those are only two point sensors, so it's not very good. I mean, you may drive by a chair leg and see something and not see something, and then so he gets a little herky-jerky, kind of like looking around. So the Kinect sensor is, has, this, has a sweep, so we've got m multiple range points and actually can go up and down as well, so we can get a much better view of what's out there. But if this, if we lose connectivity, presumably with with the um, with this thing, it goes into this de graceful degradation mode of, of using IR based roam. So, um, and I don't think if we have time, I'll come back to because I think it's interesting the the, the feature roam and talking to the um, connect sensors. But I wanted to give some time for for um, for setting this up. Um, and I'm going to try to see if I can do that in multi, well, you know, what? I'll just show the videos and then we'll just do it real time. So these are the, the videos. So What's mission? Turn up the volume. Is this a roamer? We'll be paying for some counseling later in life. I have a feeling. <laughs> so that was a backup maneuver. Here he's going roaming and then just tries to turn in time but instead couldn't catch it so he does invokes a uh, probably a uh, impact avoidance maneuver here he's making slight adjustments dur during roam mode shoes. No, no, it's just getting it as it can. So now here's a beta version without the connect sensor, kind of using pure the IR roaming mode. And Luca, my, my two-year-old, expresses his displeasure with the whole project. He senses the coming. Can he get around? There's a lot of obstacles in here. Coming of the robots. It's stuck in a little corner there. So we have bar stools in here, and that's when we added so the connect sensor so that <laughs> we could better detect wall. those. Uh oh, maybe he'll back up. He's backing up now. Now he's going to turn around. Now maybe he'll come out here. What do you think? Huh? Here he comes. No, no, he's all right. He's our friend. It's a good robot. Oh, don't be afraid of the robot. The robots are our friends, Luca. Luca. The robots are our friends. <laughs> Do you want me to turn them off? Yeah. You want me to shut them down? Yeah. Okay, he'll remember that. <laughs> giving, giving the E stop command. Okay, he's off. 
Does that make you happy? Do you like them on or off? <laughs> okay. Well, I guess you don't really appreciate my work. <laughs> All right. So that's that's that. So now, network willing. Demo gods. You know, this is it's always great to do live robot demos because. Well, um, we, don't, we don't really need it, but, but what I wanted to do for demonstration purposes is I wanted to show um, sort of what some of the maneuvers it's doing um, just and, and start and stop it um, right from the command line and be able to also um, issue a stop right from the command line. We didn't build a GUI or anything for it, um, but yes, actually, so, um, so the other thing is uh, yeah, there's some things that we have planned for the um, uh, community keynote that will, is going to lend itself to some wireless Wi-Fi connectivity. So I'm, I'm a little wary of it, and it may change in the next two days or whatever. But, but it's because, um, yeah, when you come into an environment like this, everybody's got something, uh, computers or, or, or what have you. But I think, I mean, we've been, we've been doing this quite a bit in the lab, so we'll see if this this works. All right. Okay. So we are connected. So let's see. Oh, well, first I want to unplug this anyway. I wanted to have them charge. Did I? Did it? Oh, did I? Okay, I'll check that. So let's see. And the other thing is when it when I turned when I was turning it on like having it automatically come on. I didn't get to see if everything loaded correctly and, and I just felt that this would be better. So we got one response. Let's see. This is our Wi-Fi connectivity. So while I'm doing this too, I can multitask and take some questions. If anybody has some questions, you might as well. So it's practically autonomous, right? Does Wi-Fi still override that? Um, it's practically autonomous. Well, um, there's no robot that's fully autonomous, hopefully. <laughs> Because that means it decides that it's got to go to lunch or something. So, <laughs> so um, yes, there are shades of autonomy. Um, it, you know, the, the program's running on the board. Um, we, uh, but just to start and stop it. Uh, again, I wanted to show you kind of the states it, it goes through. So what I, you know, worst case, I'll just reboot the thing here and see what happens. But yeah, uh, but it looks like I, I've got a connection. So, it just seems. Slow, which I'm puzzled by. But but actually, I'm 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 not. I mean, I was fully aware that this could be an issue. Let me get him ready here. So when he comes on, he goes. 
Alright. He doesn't do well with wires either. So let's see. Okay, I'm going to reboot him. Power down. Power up. Yeah, the scary thing this morning was it put itself in sort of um, auto start mode. I don't know how that happened and I wasn't expecting it. And I had it, where did I have it? Oh yeah, just just went, went ballistic and just knocked over some water and... Yeah. Ah, safety is a yeah, secondary concern. So yeah, any other questions as this being potentially comes to life? Looks like he's a little better. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Um, we're we're in the process of, of doing that. We've been meaning to do it for a while. Um, Which license? Uh, we have we are going to have a, a license that makes it free for um, low, you know, reasonably low and and no commercial use. So it's a hybrid license. So you know, if someone sells two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of stuff, that's free but you know then once you once you start to make a killing you know we'd like to get some support <laughs> so but it's op you know it is open source you know in that sense oh, I already opened that so I'm already there and Any other questions while we're waiting for a little? Yeah. Uh, is there a limitation on how many sensors you can attach? And uh, do we have to buy sensors which are compatible with an axe platform only, or can we get some outside as well? Oh, yeah, no, everything's off the shelf. Nothing is, is uh, you know, you just, you know, maybe that you have to write a driver for it. Um, it, uh, um, but that would be that would be like the worst case you know s s scenario. But the drivers are usually, um, you know, s simple to write, and we have some information on how to do that. Um, so are there codes available to connect new sensors? Yes, mm -hmm. and there's actually in some cases you don't even have to write any code. It's it's if you if you if you've got an Ethernet or a serial based um, uh, interface. Uh, you can, um, you know, you, you can use this the packetization scheme. Let me see. I'm sorry. Motors. Um, they are DC geared, brushed motors. See if I can get to him from the admin panel. See, he was just up. Maybe a good thing would be to restart the router. How about that?
clear out any collisions. Yeah, it's just very yeah, it's loose. This is a non real time non real time system. Any other questions? You showed us uh, an info ability. What about the uh, ability systems for uh, air, helicopter? Yeah, we've done some uh, unmanned air vehicle apps. We, we were here in Java 1 in 2007, I think, and did had an application. Um, because, you know, at that level, I mean, we've got a max UGV framework, which is catered for unmanned ground vehicles, but um, we don't have a... Um, a Max UAV framework per se, but we've done applications using Max, of course, to drive motors and and sensors and and uh, and and things of the like for air vehicles. Um, uh, mainly, it was a, that that was a terrain scanning application. So. Uh, Any other? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that there is a computer on board which is running Windows. So can we put like another computer, Raspberry Pi, or plug computer, and port the application into it, which has Linux? And if we can do that, then what is the minimum resource requirement for this? Um. Uh, the. Um. Yes, you can use Raspberry Pi. I mean, that's if you can get one, and it's it's Linux based, right? Um, the um, the Open NI drivers are not. Uh, we haven't done we haven't done any of the Linux um, uh, porting for the or haven't done any testing with uh, Linux using the N Open NI drivers. Um, so that's been. Um, That that that's been uh, you know sort of put off, so um, yeah, but but you can you can use it. We we haven't we we've got a Raspberry Pi, I think I think we just got one in or, uh, but we haven't done any specific testing with. But there's nothing here that limits you from any processor. I mean, it's just uh, you know we've run on everything at this stage. <laughs> 